Now let's get started with a review of the normal anatomy and physiology of the GI tract. We begin with a review of the layers of the gut wall. From inside to outside, the layers are mucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa adventitia. The mucosa is composed of epithelium for absorption, the lamina propria for support, and the muscularis mucosa for motility. The muscularis externa contains the myenteric nerve, also known as the Auerbach's plexus, and the serosa or adventitia serves as the external covering. There are multiple layers of the abdominal wall which vary depending on location between the anterior and posterior midlines. A surgeon entering the abdomen in the right upper quadrant would traverse the following layers in this order. Skin, superficial fascia, external oblique muscle, internal oblique muscle, transverse abdominis muscle, transverse fascia, extra peritoneal tissue, and peritoneum. You can remember this with the mnemonic, Sally Struthers eats Indian toddlers to enlarge peritoneum. Multiple organs and structures are located in the retroperitoneal space behind the abdominal cavity, which include the second, third, and fourth parts of the duodenum, ascending and descending colon, rectum, kidneys and ureters, adrenal glands, the head and body of the pancreas, the aorta, and the IVC. Embryologically, the organs of the GI tract develop from the primitive gut as follows. The foregut develops into the stomach and proximal duodenum, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. All derive blood supply from the celiac artery at the T12-L1 level and parasympathetic innervation from the vagus nerve. Midgut develops into the intestinal tract from the distal duodenum to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. It derives blood supply from the SMA at the L1 level and parasympathetic innervation from the vagus nerve. Hindgut develops into the colon from the distal one-third of the transverse colon to the upper portion of the rectum, deriving blood supply from the IMA at the L3 level and parasympathetic innervation from pelvic nerves. The three major branches of the celiac trunk are the common hepatic artery, the splenic artery, and the left gastric artery. The stomach derives its circulation from branches of the three arteries just mentioned, which include branches of the left gastric artery, the right gastric artery off of the hepatic artery, the gastroduodenal artery off of the common hepatic artery, and the right and left gastroepiploic arteries off of the gastroduodenal artery and splenic artery, respectively. Anatomy at the cellular level in the liver align plates of hepatocytes with their apical surfaces adjacent to bile canaliculi, which drain bile toward the bile duct, and basolateral surfaces to hepatic sinusoids, which drain hepatic venous blood 
toward the central vein. Note that hepatic venous blood flows in the opposite direction of bile. Hepatic sinusoids are akin to irregular capillaries with a fenestrated endothelium and lack of a basement membrane that allow plasma macromolecules free access to hepatocytes through the perisinusoidal space, also called the space of dis. Important biliary structures are the gallbladder, which empties into the cystic duct, which joins the common hepatic duct, arising from the left and right hepatic ducts, to form the common bile duct. The common bile duct joins the pancreatic duct distally at the ampulla of Vader and empties into the duodenum at the sphincter of Odi. There are a number of significant ligaments within the abdomen, including the falciform ligament, which connects the liver to the anterior abdominal wall and contains the ligamentum teres, a derivative of the fetal umbilical vein. The hepatoduodenal ligament, which connects the liver with the duodenum and contains the portal triad, which is made up of the hepatic artery, portal vein, and common bile duct. The gastrohepatic ligament, which connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver and contains the gastric arteries and separates the right greater and lesser sacs. The gastrocolic ligament, which connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon. It is a component of the greater omentum and contains the gastroepiploic arteries. There is the gastrosplenic ligament, which connects the greater curvature of the stomach with the spleen and contains the short gastric arteries separating the left greater and lesser sacs, and the splenorenal ligament, which connects the spleen with the posterior abdominal wall in front of the left kidney and contains the splenic artery and vein. The muscle of the esophageal wall varies along the level of the esophagus. The upper one-third is striated muscle, the middle one-third is striated and smooth muscle, and the lower one-third is comprised of smooth muscle. Now let's take a look at the enteric nerve plexuses related to the gut. The myenteric, or Auerbach's plexus, manages motility along the entire gut wall. It contains cell bodies of some parasympathetic terminal effector neurons and is situated between the inner circular and outer longitudinal smooth muscle layers of the gut wall. There is also the submucosal or Meissner's plexus. It controls blood flow, secretions, and absorption. It contains cell bodies of some parasympathetic terminal effector neurons and is situated between the mucosa and inner circular layer of smooth muscle of the gut wall. The anatomy of the femoral region from lateral to medial is nerve, artery, vein, empty space, lymphatics. You can remember this with the mnemonic navel. The femoral triangle contains the femoral nerve, artery, and vein, and the femoral sheath is the facial tube approximately 3 to 4 centimeters below the inguinal ligament 
that contains the femoral artery, vein, and canal with deep inguinal lymph nodes. The femoral nerve is not present. The inguinal canal is a tubular passage that extends from the internal or deep inguinal ring to the external or superficial inguinal ring and contains the spermatic cord in men. It traverses the parietal peritoneum, transversalis fascia, transversus abdominis muscle, internal oblique muscle, and external oblique muscle. Pyers patches refer to unencapsulated lymphoid tissue located in the submucosa and lamina propria of the small intestine whose specialized M cells take up antigen. Their stimulated B cells migrate to the lamina propria of the intestine via blood and lymph and develop into plasma cells that secrete IgA which moves across the epithelium to battle intraluminal antigens. Bruner's glands are located in the duodenal submucosa and secrete alkaline mucus, which serves to neutralize acidic contents entering from the stomach. These glands may show hypertrophy in peptic ulcer disease. Now let's take a closer look at salivary secretion. We begin with a look at the salivary glands. They include the parotid gland, which is located laterally and has the most serous secretions. You can remember their location with the mnemonic serous on the side. There are also the submandibular gland, submaxillary gland, and the sublingual gland, which is located medially and has the most mucinous secretions. You can remember this with mucinous in the middle. Salivary function includes alpha amylase, which initiates starch digestion and is inactivated by low pH of the stomach. Bicarbonate, which neutralizes bacterial acids in the mouth and helps to preserve dental health, and mucins or glycoproteins, which aid in the lubrication of food. There are also GI secretions of note. The first is intrinsic factor. Produced in gastric parietal cells, it binds vitamin B12 which is necessary for its absorption in the terminal ileum. Gastric acid is produced in gastric parietal cells and decreases gastric pH. Its secretion is regulated by histamine, gastrin, and acetylcholine, which increase levels of gastric acid, and by somatostatin, prostaglandin, secretin, and GIP, which decrease levels of gastric acid. There are a host of GI hormones arising from multiple sources that have various actions. Cholecystokinin is produced in the eye cells of the duodenum and jejunum, causing an increase in gallbladder contraction and pancreatic secretion and a decrease in gastric emptying. Gastric inhibitory peptide, or GIP, is produced in the K cells of the duodenum and jejunum with the exocrine function of decreasing gastric hydrogen secretion and the endocrine function of increasing insulin release. Gastrin is produced in the G cells of the stomach antrum causing an increase in gastric hydrogen secretion, gastric motility, and growth of gastric mucosa. Motilin is produced in the small intestine 
and generates migrating motor complexes, or MMCs. Nitric oxide promotes smooth muscle relaxation, including that of the lower esophageal sphincter. Secretin is produced in the S cells of the duodenum, causing increase in pancreatic bicarbonate and bile secretion, and a decrease in gastric acid secretion. Somatostatin is produced by the D cells of the GI mucosa and pancreatic islet cells, causing a decrease in gastric acid and pepsinogen secretion, gallbladder contraction, insulin and glucagon release, and pancreatic and small intestinal fluid secretion. And finally, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, or VIP, is produced in parasympathetic ganglia of the gallbladder, small intestine, and sphincters. Several factors, such as histamine, acetylcholine, gastrin, PGI2, and PGE2, are capable of stimulating gastric acid secretion by connecting with their specific cell membrane receptors, which in turn signal the production and secretion of gastric acid. There are also a number of pancreatic enzymes. They include alpha amylase, which is secreted in its active form and participates in starch digestion, lipase, phospholipase A, and colipase participate in fat digestion. The proteases trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidases are secreted as proenzymes known as zymogens and participate in protein digestion. Trypsinogen under the influence of enterokinase or enteropeptidase from the duodenal mucosa converts to the active enzyme trypsin. Both carbohydrate digestion and absorption involve a number of enzymes. For carbohydrate digestion, Salivary amylase initiates digestion by hydrolyzing alpha-1,4 linkages to generate disaccharides. Pancreatic amylase hydrolyzes starch to form oligosaccharides and disaccharides and is most heavily concentrated in the lumen of the duodenum. Oligosaccharide hydrolases are the rate-limiting step in carbohydrate digestion and form monosaccharides from oligo and disaccharides. They are located at the brush border of the intestine. For carbohydrate absorption, only monosaccharides such as glucose, galactose, and fructose are absorbed by enterocytes. Glucose and galactose uptake is facilitated by SGLT1, which is sodium dependent, and fructose is taken up by facilitated diffusion via GLUT5. All three monosaccharides are transported to the blood by GLUT2. Welcome to the Rapid Learning Medical Tutorial Series. Today's lecture is on the gastrointestinal system.
By completing this tutorial, you will learn about normal processes, abnormal processes, and therapeutic principles of the gastrointestinal system.